thank you very much for joining me for this session of our introduction to the Episcopal Church. I'd like us to consider in some detail at least today the Book of Common Prayer. First let's talk about what exactly is the Book of Common Prayer. You can go to a bookstore and you can find many books of prayers, whole books that have nothing in them but prayers. And while the Book of Common Prayer does indeed have a great many prayers, it's not just a book of prayers. By the prayer book or the Book of Common Prayer, we mean that it is a document which leads us to be able to pray together. It also outlines our liturgies. It tells a good deal about the history, the historical documents of the church. It gives us liturgies for our daily prayers as well as our Eucharists when we join together for the Holy Eucharist. Uh, it gives a great deal of very rich information, uh, a good portion of it, I'm sorry to say, most of us don't know very much about. So, in this session, we're going to look fairly closely at the Book of Common Prayer. I think a question that it's fair to ask is, well, why should we know anything about the Book of Common Prayer? After all, we come to church on Sunday, and usually we don't even have to pick up the prayer book itself because it's all printed for us and we just read it. So why do we need to know about the Book of Common Prayer? Well, first of all, it's a companion to the Bible. Uh, there has been some criticism, some people from time to time have said, oh, those Episcopalians use the prayer book instead of the Bible. Not at all true. First of all, we read a tremendous amount of the Bible in our worship services aloud. But also, a tremendous portion of the Book of Common Prayer is Scripture. It is taken directly from the Bible. We do not replace the Bible with the Book of Common Prayer. It is a companion. There is sometimes criticism that people will say that Episcopalians have replaced the Bible with the Book of Common Prayer. That certainly is not the case. First of all, I need to point out that we read probably more scripture aloud, uh, that is to say, in a loud voice, uh, in our worship services than virtually any other church, although our Roman brothers and sisters uh, do the same. So we do not give, uh, we do not relegate the Bible to a low position in any case. And a great deal of the Book of Common Prayer is indeed scripture, things that are taken directly out of the Bible. So we don't replace it. In fact, we get a double dose of the Bible by reading the Bible itself, plus our prayers and our liturgies, which are in the Book of Common Prayer. I think it's fair to ask, well, then why should we study this? After all, when we come to church on Sunday morning, we can probably get through the service without even picking up the Book of Common Prayer because the service is printed out for us. We just follow along in the leaflet. But I can assure you that if you use the Book of Common Prayer on your own, you will find that it will strengthen your spiritual life. There is so much beauty, so much to be learned from it, that you will find that it will strengthen you. So if for no other reason, I commend to you the Book of Common Prayer. Also, the use of this book unites us with other Christians especially those which follow the apostolic faith. That is to say, we have a church which traces its roots to the apostles themselves and to their teaching. The Roman Catholic Church, our church, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, and some others, all use forms of the prayer book. And so we unite ourselves, most especially, to all of the churches of the Anglican Communion. There are dozens upon dozens of, ch of countries throughout the world which have churches which are directly related as we are to the Church of England. And so although maybe the prayer book in New Zealand will be a slightly different, the one in another country will still be yet a, a bit different, nonetheless they are essentially the same. And so we unite ourselves to Anglicans especially throughout the world by use of the Book of Common Prayer. So that's a, a, another excellent reason to make use of it. And also it outlines all of our liturgies, uh, our manner of worship. And we'll look into that in a little bit uh, more detail in a moment. Let's have just a thumbnail sketch of the history of the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, th there, are, there are many sort of minutia that we could go into, but I'm going to just hit the highlights and we can study it more in detail on your own later. The first prayer book published in English, that 
is to say, for use by the English church, by the church in England, was in 1552. This was the prayer book of Edward VI of England. Now, we have to remember that this came right after the Protestant Reformation. Um, so, there was need for a book that was somewhat different from the Roman Catholic book, and yet there is no question but that this is related to the Roman Catholic uh, missals and prayer books which were in use before Edward VI. But in his time, uh, the prayer book was decidedly published for an English, uh, an Anglican congregation. There were additional revisions as uh, political scenes changed, doctrine changed, uh, social scenes changed, etc. Until 1662, when the prayer book of England was published, and that prayer book, the prayer book of 1662, remained in use in the churches in England with no further revision until the 20th century. For one thing, that tells us what a powerful book it is, what a wonderful, rich book it is, that it could have lasted that long. In 1892, we had the first American prayer book. Now, not the first time a prayer book had been printed in America. That had already happened, but it was essentially, the, it was the Anglican, the English prayer book. But the first time we printed an American prayer book was in 1892. And of course, this meant that we changed some of the prayers rather than praying for the parliament and the queen, etc., that we were praying for our own leaders and officials. This lasted essentially unchanged until 1928. Imagine that, how long that prayer book lasted. Things had changed in the world during that time. America had taken its place among uh, major powers in the world, and it was thought that it was time to revise that book to have a, an essentially American viewpoint. However, it retained a great deal of the Elizabethan language which had been previously used. During the late 60s and early 70s, we began thinking about publishing a new prayer book. And there was great consternation because people loved the 1928 prayer book. And I remember going through the difficulties of arriving at the 1979 prayer book, which is the one we presently use. Trial services were made up and sent out to all of the parishes, and we were instructed to use them for certain periods of time. Then there was tremendous discussion, which would all go back to the national uh, boards to consider. And finally, after what was really quite a lot of turmoil, this 1979 prayer book came into being. It was, by and large, a compromise, because you will find right one services, which are, for all intents and purposes, the 1929 prayer book. There are some minor differences, but nonetheless, it is essentially the 1929 prayer book in Rite 1. So those people who wanted to use, to continue using the beautiful language, etc., are certainly allowed to do so. And then there is also the more modern language, which is used in Rite 2 services. So we have a choice, which is sort of the Anglican way, isn't it? That we, we try to make room for all persons. So within this prayer book, we have right one and right two, Elizabethan English for those of us who love the beauty of that, and the more modern English for those who are more comfortable with that. I think there is, however, also another difference uh, that we need to recognize. And as you study the prayer book yourself, uh, I suggest that you <clears throat> read right one carefully and notice that it focuses more on atonement. We talk about our unworthiness, etc. And it really leads us to contemplate on the atonement through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, while I'm not saying that that is not part of the right to service, the right to service is 
uh, focuses more on celebration of, of rejoicing in what was done rather than focusing on the atonement itself. So as you read all of the right one and right two services, you'll find that helpful, I think, to, to look at those uh, differences. Well, the Book of Common Prayer, somewhat like the Bible, is more than one book. It's more than one book. And they've been bound together for our convenience, and yet it's really more than one book. When we begin looking at the prayer book, the first part of it is, for all intents and purposes, a breviary. A breviary. A breviary is <clears throat> a collection of the liturgies for daily use. Now, I have here for you my own copy, which Father Joe's lovingly gave me uh, at my, when I made my promises uh, in the Dominican order. And this gives every day's services, completely printed out, all of the lessons, all of the prayers for every daily service. So while we simply call it the daily office book, it is essentially a breviary. Now, if you open the Book of Common Prayer... Let's go to, right after the calendar, etc., let's go to page 37. We see here, daily morning prayer. Right, right one. Following that, you will find evening prayer. Right one. You will then find other services. Morning prayer. Right two. Evening prayer. Right two. You will also find liturgy for a noonday prayer, and you will find a liturgy for Compline on page 127. Compline is the service that we say late in the evening, just as we go to bed. So these services really are a, the part of this book which we might call our breviary. These services come from the ancient monastic traditions in which the monks and nuns would engage in prayer services around a 24-hour period. They would start early in the morning with certain prayers and psalms, etc., and then at the daybreak, and then at noon, and others in the afternoon, and in the evening, and at bedtime. And these prayers, they had to get up and go pray all through the day. Well, we Episcopalians weren't quite willing to do that. So we reduced... The, all of these monastic prayers essentially into two services, morning prayer and evening prayer. In older versions of the prayer book, you will find only these two services. But fortunately, when the 1979 Book of Common Prayer was published, they put back in the noon prayer and the complement. So we are somewhat now more in touch with the original ideas of praying round the clock. And all of these services, whether in Rite 1 or Rite 2, are bound together for our use. And this is our breviary, or we call it the daily office book. So that's the first book that's a part of the Book of Common Prayer. And then if we turn past that, we will find beginning on page 148, the Great Litany. This Great Litany is the oldest liturgy that we have available from the ancient church. This is the first liturgy that we have, which we have printed, which, is, which was made available to us through the ancient church in England. And this is used for a variety of occasions. It can be used as a, as a short service within itself. It can be used as a part of other services. We sometimes use it as the beginning to services, uh, to other services. It's a wonderful litany, and it encompasses almost all facets of human condition and asks God to deliver us and to have mercy on us and be with us. So I suggest that if you have not read and studied the great litany, beginning on page 148, that you take the time to do it. You 
you will be blessed by it. And then beginning our next section is on page 160, excuse me, 159. These are the collects. Collects are simply prayers. And as the name suggests, it collects certain ideas and puts them all together in one given prayer. If you look on page 159, for example, the first prayer you see is a prayer for the first Sunday of Advent. So we take the ideas that the Scripture has given us, the Scriptures used for the first Sundays of Advent, and we have a prayer which is written especially for that Sunday. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light. Now, in the time of this mortal life in which thy Son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to just both the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we continue through the church here every Sunday of the year. And also look, for example, on page 169. We have specific prayers for each of the days in Holy Week. We have prayers for each of the Sundays in Pentecost, etc. And then if you look on page 199, it simply says various occasions. It is very difficult to find uh, a condition which is not covered by a prayer in the Book of Common Prayer. These are given usually in uh, traditional language and then following that in a more contemporary language. Do we have a question? Okay, just answered that one. All right. So, and again, you can choose which language you wish to use, uh, to, which means the most uh, to you. We also then have what are called croppers. These are collects which the priests say uh, at each of the services. So there is a, a collect, a cropper, which is, for example, on page 231. Notice it says proper 10, to be used on the Sunday closest to July 13th. So again, through all of the church here, there are prayers for every Sunday, for daily prayers, for all sorts and conditions. <clears throat> so now let's turn to page 264, where we find liturgies for special occasions. On 264, we have a specific liturgy for Ash Wednesday, for example. On 276, the service for Good Friday. We have the Easter Vigil service. We have penitential orders, which we can use to confess our sins and to ask for mercy. And then sort of in the middle of the prayer book, why in the middle? Why don't we have the Holy Eucharist at the beginning? Actually, I think it's practical. It's much easier to hold the Holy Eucharist open in the middle of the book than it is at the beginning of the book. All right? But we have now gone from the breviary into what we could call the missal. In other words, we are now into that portion of the Book of Common Prayer, which gives our liturgies for the Eucharist. Eucharist means thanksgiving. So our principal service in the Episcopal Church is the Eucharist, which is not to put morning prayer and evening prayer. It's not to denigrate them. But this is the one where we all come together, pray together, and then receive the body and blood of Christ together. Let's take just a minute to talk about the Holy Eucharist. <clears throat> Again, we have Rite 1, for those of us who want to use the more traditional language. We have Rite 2, with a more modern language. But in either case, the Holy Eucharist is divided into two major categories. There are two, two portions, you might say. The first portion is that of the ministry of the Word, and then the second is the ministry of the Holy Communion. The ministry of the Word is exactly what it sounds like it is. It's that portion of the service where we hear God's word read aloud and which through a sermon is interpreted and expounded upon for our good. 
and then we make responses to it. Because most of you are perhaps more familiar with right two, let's turn to page 355, 355 in the Book of Common Prayer. And it says the Word of God. There is a very short little greeting section, you might say, an introduction, where we begin by blessing God, we pray a prayer together that we will have everything cleansed from us and be able to worthily hear the Word of God and to receive it and to participate in the Holy Communion. We then begin the liturgy proper. The name that we use is normally the Holy Eucharist, but other names are equally valid. The Mass, the Great Liturgy, the Divine Liturgy, they all mean essentially the same. We have songs and canticles, we have, we have hymns, we have things like the glory to God in the highest, etc., in which we sing together. And we also have the scriptures where we simply listen. We have the Old Testament lessons, the New Testament lessons, the Psalms, the Gospel, and following those, we have the sermon. In response to the sermon, and in response to all of the scriptures we have just heard, we as a congregation say, right, I accept those things, let's stand up and say what we believe. So in view of the word which we have heard, and the sermon which we have heard, we stand up and together we say the creed. We say what we believe. I have had people say to me, well just what do Episcopalians believe? And I say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Because our beliefs are those which are in the creed. In response to the creed, after we have said, this is what we believe, we all together affirm these things to be true. Then we need to pray. And we start then with the prayers of the people. If you keep one hand sort of in there, and then turn over to page 383, you will see that there are various forms of the prayers of the people. The priest is able to choose which of these he or she would like to use. And we usually uh, alternate between these. There are others which have been written and are available through the national church that we can also use. And also, it is quite uh, possible for individual churches to write their own prayers of the people. And many do. As long as we pray for the things that are listed on page 359, we can make our own prayers to the people. For example, it says that we should pray for the universal church, the nation, welfare of the world, concerns of the local community, pray for those who suffer or are in trouble, pray for the departed, etc. So as long as we include all of those things, we can have our own prayers of the people. And after we have prayed for everyone, we have made intercession, we then say we need to confess our own sins. We're not only going to pray for everybody else, but let's pray for us. Because we've all sinned. And so we have the confession of sin. The priest assures us that we have indeed been forgiven. And then our response to that is to greet one another. I used to think, well, the peace is nothing more than halftime. You know, I failed to see what the peace really was. I, oh, well, this is just an unnecessary break in the service, and it's very disturbing to me. But the fact is that the peace, I turn to each of you and say, the peace of our Lord be with you, or I love you, or whatever. I'm responding, you're responding, to all that we have done so far. We've listened to the scriptures. We've heard the sermon. We've prayed for everybody else. We've prayed for our own forgiveness. We've been assured that we are forgiven. And we say, that's a good thing. Let's tell each other. Let's bless each other. So that's the peace. And then we come to the second major part of the service, which is the service of the Great Communion. We begin with this wonderful prayer called the Great Thanksgiving. This goes back to ancient times. Again, we have several forms which are available to us. Again, the priest can choose which form he or she wishes to use. They have different, um, each one will have a different focus. Uh, and sometimes we choose them according to the time of the year. Sometimes we choose them simply because the one who's celebrating likes that particular prayer. Uh, but they're all 
equally good and wonderful. And again, there are other Eucharistic prayers which are available from the church in some of the later documents which can also be used. And after we have prayed this prayer, we <clears throat> offer ourselves. We offer the bread and the wine to be blessed. And the priest prays that it will be made holy and righteous before the Lord. And then we are asked to come together, to come forward, and to receive our communion. There are some churches where people just sit in their pews. That's perfectly all right. But one of the symbols of coming forward for communion is that we make an effort to come. We wish to get up and to go forward. And we all do the same thing. We all come forward. We all kneel and receive this wonderful communion. And then we return to our seats and we pray while our brothers and sisters go forward to receive this communion. We all do this together. Then after the communion, we give thanks for having been able to receive the body and blood of Christ. And at that point, all that we have intended to do, at least right now, in our service together has been accomplished. And we are dismissed. But notice that the dismissal is, generally speaking, a call to go out into the world and take what we have just done with us. One of my favorite dismissals is that processional. It's, let's go into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're not, it's not complete. We've just done what we came to do together here in this place at this time. But now we're to take all of that with us and to go into the world. Then why do we need to come back next week? To be renewed and re-energized and re-strengthened, to get new learning, to again celebrate together so that we can yet again go out into the world. Then we have orders for the Eucharist, which did not formally be, were not formally in, formally included. Look, for example, on page 400. This gives the priest a possibility of a rather simple way of doing the Eucharist. And we have used uh, this largely uh, at the crossroads uh, services. And it can be used uh, most of the time it is not done uh, as the main service in the nave on a Sunday morning, but it can be used. And now look at 413. We have these special uh, services such as for confirmation, reception of new members. All right, we're now into the third part of the prayer book, which we could call the ordinal. The ordinal is that part of the prayer book which gives us these special Services, some of which are administered by a priest, some of which are administered by the bishop. So we have the service of confirmation. On 423, we have the celebration and blessing of the marriage. Uh, we have on 439, thanksgiving for the birth or for the adoption of a child, which is a beautiful and wonderful thing to do. I'd like you to pay special attention to page... 447, 447. Some people say, well, the Episcopal Church doesn't have confession. Oh, yes, we do. And here are the forms which can be used. You can meet the priest in his office or in the church or wherever the two of you agree. And these are forms that you can use to say, I, I, I need to confess things I have done. And then the priest will perhaps give you some understanding and will, will say, well, you know, I, I think you need to pray about this and such. You may give you some instruction as to what to do, but will always assure you that you can be forgiven. So we do have confession. We Episcopalians may not make use of it as much as perhaps we should, but it is available. 453, ministrations to the sick. We have services for holy unction, as it is called, for ministering to the sick. We have, have special services for communion to take to people who cannot come to the services. We have many prayers and services at the time of death. For example, we have on 462 prayers and services that a priest can offer when a person is simply near death. 
and perhaps he will be called to the, to the bedside of a dying person and will use these prayers and services. We have the service for burial of the dead, both Rite 1 in a traditional language and Rite 2 in a more uh, contemporary language. And then we come to the ordination services, the ordination of a bishop, which of course must be done by other bishops. We have the ordination of priests on page 525. It's a wonderful thing to be able to be a part of. We have the ordination of deacons also. We have litanies for ordinations. We have litanies for a new ministry. We have, we have prayers for um, dedication consecration of a new church building. See, virtually everything that the church needs to do is contained in this book. And then we have something very unusual, we, that is, to most books of prayer. We have a complete book of the Bible in here, and that book is the Psalms. The entirety of the Psalms, all 150 of them, are in here, and they are an essential part of our worship. So they are there so that we can use them readily. And now just turn past those to all of these prayers. Again, we, we have prayers for every occasion. Look at page 814. Prayers for thanksgiving for the human family. We pray for peace, for a church convention, for those who are about to be baptized. There are prayers in here which are suggested for us to use before we go to communion. There are prayers which are suggested for us to use when we return to our seats after having received communion. Did you know that? Did you know that there is a prayer here that as you're kneeling before it's time for you to go up to communion, a wonderful prayer that you can say before you go forward. And then there's another equally wonderful prayer which you can use when you come back to your seat from the communion uh, in thanksgiving. Prayer for travelers, for those we love, for those who are victims of addiction. Grace at meals. Now, there is no prohibition at all in the Episcopal Church against extemporaneous prayers. And I think sometimes people think that, well, we're not supposed to just pray extemporaneously, only from the book. That is not true. But these are prayers. Some of us do not particularly think that, that we, we feel comfortable just making up a prayer, so to speak. Whatever you want to pray for, it's here. And there are prayers that we then use with each other. I want to be sure that you understand that <clears throat> starting on page 845, 845, we have a catechism. We're here. All questions are asked. What do we mean by nature? And answers are given. What do we believe about the Ten Commandments? What do we believe about God the Son? What do we believe about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Scriptures, the Church, the ministry? Who are the Church's ministers? What are the sacraments? What are our sacramental rites? What is our hope as Christians? All of these things are answered for you here. So if someone asks you, well, what does your church believe about the Trinity? It's in here. What does your church believe about holy baptism? It's in here. And then follows a section that almost none of us use, the historical documents. But they can be very instructive as we learn some of the ancient creeds, the prayer book uh, preface, the prayer book of 1549, so we go all the way back. And then we have tables for helping us find our lessons in Psalms for every day of the year. But it's easy these days for you to go on, site, on, on, on the websites to find those. You can go to uh, websites and find all of this. One is called the lectionary page. One is just called the lectionary. And you pull those up on the web website and prayers for every day and every Sunday of all the scriptures are given to you. You can also go to the web and find beautifully done complete prayer services that you can listen to morning prayer and evening prayer and follow along on the web as beautiful music playing too. So there are many ways in which you can make use of the Book of Common Prayer. It is essential for all Episcopalians, and I certainly hope that you will learn more of its riches. Do any of you have any particular comments or questions you want to ask or make about what we talked about, or something we didn't talk about? No? Yes. 
two major sacraments <clears throat> is baptism mm -hmm. and Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. I have always been fascinated by when people of other denominations come to our church, mm -hmm. they don't they don't practice in Holy Communion with us, mm -hmm. even though I know they believe mm -hmm. in Holy Communion. So I was wondering, is that a particular denomination thing, or are some people just not comfortable with coming forth for Holy Communion, maybe in front of strangers? I think it's, I think it's an excellent question. The question is about the fact that the Holy Communion is one of our sacraments, and, and very often people from other denominations or visitors come, but they don't participate in that. And what might be the reasoning for that? Well, there are some uh, denominations who uh, prohibit their members from participating in the Holy Communion with another denomination. So if someone from, from those denominations comes to visit us, then they probably feel that they should not participate, although so far as we are concerned, they are absolutely welcome. But according to what they've been taught in their own denomination, they don't feel that they should participate. Then there are others who I think, like you were saying, maybe from other more sort of, shall we say, Protestant denominations who are maybe like our Presbyterian friends who take their communion seated at their seats. And there's something for some of them that's a little difficult about getting up and going forward. And they find that to be difficult. Uh, and then I think some people are concerned about, well, do you really, really use wine? Or maybe they're concerned about drinking from the same cup. There, there are probably as many reasons as there are persons. But I think the thing to remember is that we welcome all baptized Christians, if you have faith in Jesus Christ and in his redeeming blood, you are welcome. We are not going to throw you out or think less of you if you don't come forward, but you are welcome to come. There are various reasons why they might choose not to do so, but all are welcome. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? Yes, sir. If you have been baptized in another church, if you wish to be a member of the Episcopal Church, do you have to be rebaptized? The answer is no. Uh, we accept baptism if it is done by a Christian church, by, by, by other denominations, but a part of the Christian body of Christ. We recognize that baptism. I was baptized in Galley Creek. No, I was dunked under up in Galley Creek. That was my baptism. Nobody ever said to me, well, you can't be an Episcopalian, Lewis, unless you come up here and we rebaptize you. Not at all. That is, that is accepted as, as, uh, as true baptism. Now, sometimes you will have some person who is not really quite sure whether they've been baptized. And it's possible to do something which is called conditional baptism, in which we will say, I baptize you in the event that you have not already been baptized. So we're not saying if you have been, that's null and void, and we're doing it again. If you don't know, uh, and some people really don't. We, we've had a person or two who were baptized in kind of a cult situation, and they you know, I'm not sure that I think that was valid, and so we can baptize them. Um, but you do not have to be rebaptized if it has been from a Christian body. Uh, generally speaking, when possible, the bishop does the baptisms, but it is by no means an inferior situation if the priest does the baptism. And also, the Episcopal Church says that in uh, extraordinary cases, if someone is, is at the point of, of death, for example, and they say, I want to be baptized, but, but there is no time that even a lay person, as a baptized person, can baptize someone else. Now, we have to be extremely careful about that. But if there is someone who's dying and they say, you know, I want to accept Christ, and there's not time to bring someone else, then if you are, if you are a baptized Christian yourself, that you can say, you know, I, I baptize you as a believer myself. So baptism is of extreme importance to all of us. Yes? Is there a form for that last one? 
No, not really. There's no, the question was if there are form for that. And no, and I, I think that it's simply to say, I baptize you, and, 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 and you can you can you can pray yourself. I'm going to put this water on them, and I pray, Lord, that this will be uh, seen as being holy. Um, and uh, if there are those who, for example, might do that if a baby were born, they feared that child was going to die immediately, and they don't not. That there's a lot of theological questions about whether that child needs baptism, etc. But 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 the point is that there will be those who will baptize in that way. Yes. My, yeah. My children, as I said, I was Lutheran, right. and my children were baptized infants. Right. But the majority of them have gone through a second baptism when they were older. When they were older, we have the right of confirmation. So and 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 that's a good. Point because some people say, well, that's either a, that, that in our church, that in the Episcopal church, that confirmation is like a second baptism. No, it's not baptism. It, we, we confirm. We agree. We say, now that I can speak for myself, I uphold what was done on, in my behalf earlier. <clears throat> and then some people uh, will say that, that, well, that's the completion of baptism. But we don't hold that to be the case either. Baptism, when done, is complete within itself. You have received the Holy Spirit. You are fully a member of Christ's body. This is simply a, a, an opportunity for you to stand up and say, as an adult, I can speak for myself, and, and I, I affirm and confirm the things that were done uh, for me. Yes? The, uh, the newcomers that will join our mm -hmm. church mm -hmm. at their own discretion mm -hmm. in their walk with God, right? like, for example, my mother... That's, is that reaffirmation or is that confirmation? Like, would they, well, they want to become part of this official there, thing? There, there are various possibilities. <clears throat> if a person has already been baptized uh, in, let's say, Lutheran, okay, then you can come forward and you're, you don't have to be baptized. Uh, and so they will say, we receive you. So, so they're not so much confirmed as they are received. Yeah, because we say, you know, you, we already recognize that you are a part of Christ's body. You know, we're not saying, well, if you're not an Episcopalian, you're not a real Christian. You know, you know, we're, we're saying we realize that some of you Baptists and Presbyterians are really fine Christians. So we receive you into our branch, our part of the church. And this yeah. is more or less just a, a public recognition that the person wants to go through and say, you know, I, this is what I want to do. And I want to be recognized in a public way. And then those who, who have not yet been confirmed and, and wish to be confirmed, then those people can be received. So normally if the bishop comes, there will be uh, some people, that, you know, the priest you know, follows along and accuse the bishop what to say. This one's, this one's being received, Bishop. I receive you. This one's being deferred. I confirm you. So uh, this, is, this is the way you do that. But you can be received if you are already a part of Christ's body. You can be confirmed if you have not already taken that step. Yes, sir. One last. Yeah. Why does the Episcopal Church use wine in the communion and not grape juice? Well, good question. Why do we use wine and not grape juice? Many... Uh, uh, denominations, of course, do use uh, grape juice. I grew up on that. And, and as kids, we'd say Welch's and wafers, and of course, we'd been thumped on the head if our parents had heard us say that. Uh, I think it's because, well, let's remember the uh, turning of the water into wine, that Christ himself turned water into wine. And let's face it, it must have been pretty rank stuff back in those days because modern brewing techniques weren't invented until hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years later. So Christ himself used wine at that dinner. And, so, and, and we have every reason to believe that when Jesus gathered for that last supper with his disciples, that, that it was wine. That's what people used. Why would he have been any different? So he drank wine and ate bread with his own disciples. And then when we were called to go out into the world and, and to follow uh, as they had done, then we have continued to use wine. Uh, I, I don't think we're judgmental against people who use grape juice if that's what they... Some people don't like the fact that we use little patents. They think it should be just a loaf of bread. And so, you know, there are all manner of, of, uh, of, uh, 
opinions as to how something should be done. Uh, one of my favorite statements is from C.S. Lewis, who says, there's only one true church. Unfortunately, I am the only member. So, you know, I mean, that's sort of the way we are. You know, there's only one real church, but I'm the only one who's in it, you know. So we have a variety of opinions, but uh, I think that probably that's the reason we do use wine. Christ himself did by turning water into wine, blessing it that way, used it with his own disciples, and we have continued in that uh, practice. Thank you all very much.